Hello, thank you for your patience. Welcome to the Clinical Leadership Webinar presented by Dr. Vince Connolly, Acute Physician and Medical Director of ESIP. First, we have just a few simple housekeeping points. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available to view on our website shortly. That's the, the three websites. All attendees are muted to avoid background noise during the recording. At the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand option in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can write your question in the question section on the panel. During the Q&A sections, we will unmute you to ask your question in person. Thank you, and I'll now hand you over to Vince. Thank you, Vince. Thank you very much, Paula. Good afternoon, everybody. I imagine most people are sitting with a sandwich at their at their desk, so I'm glad the mute's on and I can't hear you all munching and, uh, and, and slurping away with, with your drinks. What I'm going to focus on today is engagement. I, and we often, an ESIST and ESIP, uh, get asked about clinical engagement. And I, I prefer to use the term engagement rather than clinical engagement. I always kind of view that if people are saying there's an issue with clinical engagement, it implies one particular side has a problem. I, whereas engagement is a two-way process and is very much dependent on how I, various people are coming together and, and working together to get engaged with resolving whichever problem or issue it is that, that, that they share just now. So that's going to be the, the focus of this. I think one of the fundamental issues uh, is for, in terms of engagement, is for people to be really clear about what it is they're trying to achieve in, in the service. And this does get confused and, and muddled quite often, I think, by by a number of, of, of factors. But if we, if we go back to what a top quality service looks like, uh, clearly it's about having the patient at the centre. It's about thinking ahead, anticipating and dealing with issues as they come up. Increasingly, it's about how teams uh, operate and, and work effectively together. Uh, and there's some interesting studies showing how important good teamwork is for for outcomes and for, for staff satisfaction. And the kind of enablers, what is the organisational support around that? How effective does it work uh, uh, in, in this regard? Or, as is sometimes the case, is it getting in the way of providing a top quality service? So, and one of the issues with engagement I find quite often is a, is a lack of understanding of uh, what is happening be, behind, the, behind the scenes. Uh, and, and behind the scenes, there are a whole web of relationships that people have. And traditionally in the hospital, I describe uh, that medical relationships are often very strong uh, and very Im important. So I've worked in my organisation for getting on for 20 years now, just over 20 years. I, I've worked with colleagues, seen them, you know, through, we've seen each other through family events, shared a whole load of experiences together. Uh, but our executive team turns over regularly. I don't see them as often. I, so it's natural that our that clinicians have a relationship, have a loyalty, have a, a an investment in their clinical colleagues first and first and foremost, and and I think that's a really important consideration because it means that in trying to think about how we move teams forward, understanding those relationships are really important. I, and I've got my little uh, dog here who's ready to go out in the sun as a kind of marker and a symbol of the kind of loyalty and, 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 uh, and trust that teams in, invest in each other and how that, how understanding that and those relationships is really important. I should have said there's, there's a chat window at the side if you want to type in uh, some comments or questions. I'll, I'll try and pick them up as, as we go along. Another important consideration is time. Now, why is time important? Well, 
the consultant contract is basically a time structured uh, contract. It means that uh, discussions about how services are provided, uh, what the arrangements are, etc., will often come back to time as a key component for uh, designing, managing, and developing a particular service or a particular aspect of the service. Uh, and, and basically, that's the, that's the currency of, of, of how senior medical staff uh, work and operate, and, and it is an, an important consideration, uh, obviously, for people to have their an appropriate work-life balance. But it will always come back to time at some point or other in terms of understanding how uh, clinicians are able to engage with particular uh, activities and, and developments in their leadership role. I, I was talking to another medical director colleague this morning uh, and he was talking about his kind of ambition to try and deal with what he perceived as an antagonism around the, the M&M uh, view of, of, of NHS management and, and management and meetings is what the M&M bit stands for. As, as, as well, and I think it's important that we kind of break into that very kind of reductionist view of of how people perceive their roles very distinctly as either clinicians or managers. And I think clinical leaders have a key role to play here in helping foster good working relationships and understanding uh, of of the of of those various roles. And I think that's. That's going to be key to addressing some of the challenges that, that lie, lie ahead. But un undoubtedly, uh, some of that is, has been set up based on people's experiences and, and views of what's, of what's happened in, in the past. And again, an awareness and a willingness to kind of address that is really important. I, there is amongst uh, all manner of, of staff a view that, you know, uh, problems kind of exist in particular departments or silos. The, the classic one that I'm close, most closely involved with is the A&E uh, standard. And still after 10 years, in many people's heads, this is still viewed as predominantly an A&E issue. So, Getting people to think wider than their immediate department, organisation or responsibilities is absolutely key to engaging them in a system-wide discussion to resolving problems and, and issues, whether that's A&E, uh, referral to treatment time, issues relating to how you know teams and departments are organised and so on as well. I think we're often too narrow-sighted and too comforted by what we see in front of us, and it leads to a lack of willingness to uh, address bigger issues. Now, there are various ways that we can address these issues, and I'm going to start backwards with the ones that I would use least uh, in terms of trying to work closely with uh, with colleagues, whether they're clinical uh, or, in, or in other leadership roles. But I think it is important for uh, uh, you know, some medical staff to appreciate that in the duties of a doctor, in the GMC guidance, it does state how important it is for uh, clinical staff to be involved in their leadership role. Uh, and in bullet point four there, demonstrate effective team working and leadership. So this isn't an option for people. This is part of day-to-day -day work and activity, and it's really important that people understand and work uh, in partnership within the wider team uh, to, to support the organisation uh, to establish good patient-centred care. Uh, here's the benign knighted uh, medical director. I, so this is the second bottom of the list of ways to engage people, which is to I take them to the naughty step outside the medical director's office, I, I often seen as a rather threatening approach to I, trying to establish engagement. However, I, it, is, it is important that the medical director is aware of 
issues and can often act as uh, an you know as an, an important role in helping to resolve, address, highlight the importance of uh, individuals' roles, how they can participate and contribute to uh, their leadership role within within the organisation, and an understanding of how that should work. Of course, this should also be part of the appraisal and ultimately revalidation process for clinical staff, uh, which should include their contributions to service improvement, leadership, uh, you know, service development, delivery of performance targets, uh, and so on as well. Of course, in ESSTENESIP, uh, we don't make up standards uh, off the top of our own head. We've largely looked to uh, colleges and societies and uh, taken the existing standards that are there. And a lot of the standards from the Royal College of Physicians, Surgeons and Emergency Medicine, Society of Acute Medicine and others uh, are exacting and challenging standards for us to you know, to, to, to strive to, to, to meet. Uh, and I think it's important that we all understand that these are agreed standards. Some of them, you know, have a good evidence base behind them. Some of them are best practice guidance uh, as, as well. But nonetheless, these are uh, agreed, published uh, as uh, what the service should be aspiring to, to achieve. So, for example, a lot of the standards in the seven-day services are derived from those from the Royal Colleges and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and others. So, when looking for standards that inform service design, I, I think these are really important considerations to understand where these standards have been derived from. Carrots and sticks are uh, important to think about designing uh, good incentives to the, the system. And I still think that we haven't mastered the incentive part of the system particularly well. So I think of what did it take to get services right for patients with fractured neck or femur. We knew the evidence, lots of clinicians knew the evidence that prompt diagnosis, early stabilization, uh, getting uh, patients with fractured neck of femur to theatre quickly, follow up by an orthogeriatrician were all really key issues to improving outcomes for this particular group of patients. However, it took, uh, it took incentives from uh, the Department of Health at the time, NHS England subsequently, around designing best practice tariffs, setting standards, publishing those standards for all of this to be delivered. So I, I suspect it's more complicated than simply knowing the evidence. There's something about generating the will, the need, the urgency and the case for change uh, to create that and get those incentives uh, rights for the service as well. And no doubt in this and some other cases, having financial resource uh, invested in that service development has, has been key as, as well. I think this is really interesting, uh, and again, I had a debate about this particular topic with, with a colleague quite recently. And this is about how financial incentives operate as well. There was a study commissioned uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank in the States. Uh, and basically, the, the conclusion of the study was that uh, then other than for very rudimentary tasks, financial incentives often led to poorer performance. Now, that's really interesting, I think, on one level. And you may look at how the system operates, waiting list initiatives as an example of how a financial incentive uh, actually leads to uh, poorer performance and certainly doesn't resolve long-term issues with waiting list management as, as, as well. So I think that was a a really interesting and prescient kind of conclusion from that study. Of course, I think what drives uh, all of us in the health service is is less about finance, but a, a kind of why of what people want to do and what they they can, they can achieve. So, you know, people 
taking up hobbies like uh, fell running, long distance cycling, ultramarathons, which seem to become increasingly popular, aren't doing this for any financial gain or incentive, but there seems to be some intrinsic drive and motivation to take part in these activities, uh, which at the time certainly isn't enjoyment. It might be enjoyment after it's all over, but it's often not enjoyment at the time. And I, I think this is understanding this is key to understanding what motivates and drives uh, colleagues in the health service. One of my uh, kind of sporting heroes was Joss Naylor. Uh, Joss was a sheep farmer in the Lake District. Uh, he took up uh, fell running as a was a holder of many uh, fell running records uh, around the, the world. He is on the list of the 100 most influential British sportsmen. But whenever I ask for a show of hands, does anyone know who Joss Naylor is? I, once I get south of Manchester, it's very unusual for anybody to have heard of, of Joss Naylor uh, MBE. However, I just completed a number of uh, mega races. And I just highlighted to the last sentence of this quote about how, what it feels like when he's involved in, in a long distance run. If you get it right, there's a point on an event like this where you are just running on a high and even after 60 to 80 miles, you can still feel that it's fantastic. It's brilliant. So this is his intrinsic motivation, what he gets from uh, participating in what to the rest of us sounds like monumental torture. So this is what we're all trying to achieve in the service. We're trying to achieve ideal care by, ma by mastering high quality patient safety, providing a service that is predictable and reliable and that enables patients to have a good experience by moving through the, the urgent and emergency care system in particular in a safe, reliable uh, way. And in pursuing effect, perfection, we've got the seven no's of uh, you know, no avoidable delays, no harm, no unnecessary pain, no waste delays, feeling of helplessness and no inequalities in the service. That's essentially what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and that's articulating that and getting that helps us understand the motivation and the drive to engagement uh, in our hospitals. Simon Sinek has said that what we're doing often is talking about the what, then the how and the why rather than the why, then the how and the what. And one of the examples that he uses is thinking about, you know, marketing for computers. Uh, so often computer, you know, when you're buying a computer, it talks about the what of the computer, the power of the processor, the size of the hard drive, the clarity of the screen, the portability of use. That's all the, the what of the computer, and that's what most manufacturers use. So they describe the what of the computer, how you can use it, and then why it's worthwhile using because it will give you good service. What Apple do is they, they invert that. They talk about the why. Why do you want to use Apple? Well, you want to use it because these are fantastic products. They're part of a suite of lifestyle uh, uh, instruments that can be used so that you know you can be part of you know, a community that use Apple products. I, how do you do that? Well, you, you become part of the Apple community by buying the products and the what is you get to use it from the outside and that's a much more engaging and clearly a much more appealing way of framing the, the, the you know, to, to be part of something. And this is really what we must get to the nub of in healthcare, the why are we here? which then determines the how we do it and the what it is we will achieve. So one of my favourite examples of this type of approach is uh, demonstrated in this slide, uh, which shows one uh, organisation's activity in blue taking off and the red one gradually uh, going out of existence and disappearing altogether some five or six years ago. And the two organisations here are Microsoft uh, 
and Carter and Wikipedia, both of whom set off to be world leading referencing products. And we all know that at that time, Microsoft was the biggest company in the world with the biggest access to resources, the best possible planning organization and people it could employ to provide a product called Microsoft and Carter. Some people will have bought it, installed it on disk drives on their computers. Hardly anybody uses it at all now. What did Wikipedia do? Well, after a few abortive attempts, Jamie Whale recruited people that felt a passion for providing referencing material that could be accessible for learning to anybody in the world with access to a computer and the internet. And with very little in the way of financial support and structure, but a fantastic why uh, and a great what, people got engaged with Wikipedia, wrote articles, edited articles, made them freely available, and you can see which one of these became our go-to referencing resource as well. So it's not always about having the maximal resource. It's more about that why and that engagement and are we doing something that adds value and is really worthwhile. This is to remind me not so much about innovators and laggards is that we as individuals might be innovators in one regard and laggards in the other. I, you know, I can I can think of, you know, colleagues uh, in you know particular specialties, they are innovators in the front of their field in one aspect of their specialist service. However, they might be slow to adopt the use of uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, etc., others in the use of modern I IT. I, I think it's just important that we understand that being an innovator or a laggard in one area doesn't mean that that's what you are for, for, for everything. Again, that can be important in understanding what motivates people. So our motivation uh, can be extrinsic, incentive, reward, and peer pressure. But I think more importantly, it's intrinsic. It's about those leadership qualities that individuals possess and the skills that they have that enable them to get up and, and do it. And what we need to do is mobilize that intrinsic uh, motivation and align the extrinsic factors uh, alongside that within our organizations. And those aspects of intrinsic motivation are summarized in the autonomy, mastery and purpose. And again, if you think about this as how a consultant would work, a mastery of you know wanting to be the, the very best, the most skilled uh, you know practitioner, perhaps the most knowledgeable, it would be the best understanding of you know their area of expertise, the purpose being you know we want to get patients better as fast and as effectively as possible and in doing so kind of have the clinical freedom to get on and, and do that as well. That That's the intrinsic motivation that people have and how do we create an environment for clinicians to achieve that. I, I think that's really what helps uh, leaders work effectively with clinical colleagues. And then there are some really interesting things that uh, organizations are doing. So Google allows uh, employees to spend 20% of their time working in ideas and projects that interest them effectively one day a week. The outcome, of course, is that anything that they do in that time is obviously part of you know, what Google achieve. And of that, some of Google's great products that we use now, 50% of those products have originated from that time that Google allows people to spend on these ideas and projects. Well, that's fantastically productive. Can we envision a time when the NHS does that for people? Can we, you know, can we trust people? Do, do we have the trust to give clinicians a day a week to think of the ideas and the projects that will improve the service? have the confidence that it will generate 50% of those ideas. It doesn't sound like it when we're looking to reduce the available time that people have for doing this, this type of work. And I think there are lessons for us to learn from uh, other uh, industries and organizations. Uh, the leadership framework is set out, uh, set out here and the qualities that we're looking for people to 
to have those personal qualities of, you know, belief, awareness, drive for improvement and people's personal integrity and how that goes along with setting direction and, and delivering the service. These are the things that we should be looking for in our aspiring leaders of the, of the future. And how do we know? So when we're doing a visit to a site, how do we know if clinicians are genuinely involved with the organisation in a really productive type of type of way? And this is, goes to the heart of how those clinicians, how the organisation have gelled together, you know, to work really effectively. So are the clinicians fully informed about the key priorities of the organisation? You know, can they talk sense? Can they articulate it? Uh, you know, do they have information? Do they have data uh, around the, those 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 kind of key issues? So, if you're on the emergency pathway, are they clear about you know what's happening? You know, externally to the organisation, how that fits in with what they are trying to achieve? Are they aware of how many? people attend the emergency department, how many admissions there are, how many go to particular departments, are they aware of the interventions that are taking place across the emergency pathway, for example. To do the clinicians feel they're able to influence that agenda? That's a test of the, whether the organisation goes out and listens to what the clinicians have to say uh, and takes back those uh, those suggestions, those ideas, those observations, and uses them to inform the organisational agenda as well. Or do they feel completely helpless that you know they're part of a pawn in a bigger organisation and they don't understand and they're not aware of how to get their issues on the organisational agenda? And so, are there shared aims uh, that everybody's committed to uh, to achieving? So that, that's, that's a, a quick test of how uh, effectively engaged organisations uh, are. Engagement is about what they are saying and not what we are telling them. That's really important. And often when I visit a site and the first thing I'm told is that the clinicians don't, aren't engaged, you often wonder, well, what message, what is it, you know, what's happening in that conversation? So it's not just about listening, it's about receptive listening. And it's then about using, you know, leaders using their skills of listening, uh, of leading, of learning from uh, clinical colleagues, uh, negotiating uh, and using diplomacy to try and you know move things forward in a really constructive uh, dialogue. So my top tips for this will from uh, Stanley McChrystal. There's the listen, learn, and lead a uh, bit of it. The missions that are coming through now, they have a completely different understanding of social media. Uh, the language that's being used by young people really different from, you know, what was what what I use as well, uh, and you can learn so much from new colleagues coming into the organisation about what they've seen happening elsewhere. For older colleagues, they're often interested in their legacy about you know, you know, we're going to retire or leave in a few years. You know, they often. Have made an important contribution to the trust, and they want their legacy to the organisation to be valued. And how can we, how can we help them help them achieve that as well? It's important in our discussions that we build trust, and we build trust by showing that we care about how people, uh, you know, feel about their work and their organisation, you know, their, their 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 employment, and that we show our credibility, our skills and our ability to, to deliver on this. I, that we you know that our primary aim is the patient and that, that is around the patient safety and the quality of service that's provided. As the medical, nursing and executive leadership of the trust completely aligned on what it is they're trying to achieve, or do you have three competing agendas? And that you know that's often that can be the case. 
an organisation. So it's important to test that out in an organisation as well. Sometimes your ideas just aren't going to land, and the ideas for those ideas, you know, the timing for those ideas isn't right. And sometimes the right step is to is to take a step back, uh, you know, deal with other issues, uh, and look at whether your idea is right, whether it needs reframing, restructuring, or you know, whether it is the right idea for that particular team uh, or part of the organisation as well. The what's in it for me rewards, I say, aren't about finance; they're about rewarding that intrinsic motivation that people have and keeping a focus on the end result of good quality patient care and not to get distracted, as is often easy to do, by a lot of the other issues that are that are going on around around it. And I'll finish up with a kind of summary of how Wikipedia looked to somebody from the outside that, you know, Jimmy Wales was more like the Queen Ant controlling what was happening, you know, across a network that he doesn't fully control, perhaps doesn't even fully understand. But he's got the trust in people to go about and do what it is they've said they'll do and that they'll deliver it because getting people to do that in a really effective way is builds huge reserve of quality and skill that can't be done, you know, by by individuals. And I think it's, you know, a great example as to how our big organisations and how the NHS should be allowed to operate. So I think it's probably time for me to stop there and to open it up to any questions. Thank you, Vince. That was really good. Thank you. Um, just to remind everybody, if you have got a question for Vince, um, you can use the raise your hand option in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. And then I can unmute you to ask your question. Or alternatively, you can write a question in the question section on the panel and then I'll read that out to Vince. Just give everybody a couple of minutes to do that. Vince, um, if anybody's got any questions after the webinar, um, would you like to give your email address? Or they could all... Yeah. Yep. It's uh, vincent.connolly. Connolly spelled C-O-N-N. O -L -L -Y at nhs.net. Alternatively, um, you could always email either the ESIP info mailbox, the AEC or Frailty mailboxes, and they're all at nhselect.org.uk. Yeah, there's some really interesting, uh, you know, on, on TED Talks, there's some great examples of. Uh, Leadership. I was looking at Stanley McChrystal's talks the, the the other day. You know, for someone who's a five-star general, and you know how his experiences and how the realization of how much the world's changed since his time as a, you know, as a, you know, as joining up to the army, and how he's had to had to adapt and change to that is is, is really interesting. Uh, so there's there's lots of great examples. Uh, out there of fantastic uh, leaders that we can all learn from. Looks like you've uh, stunned everybody. Oh, there is a question. Hold on a second. Just read Maybe it out for the you. <laughs> uh, the question's from a gentleman called Matthew Sweeting. And the question is, thanks. How does one balance your clinical commitments, which don't go away with the need to spend time engaging stakeholders, holding meetings and collecting data? Yeah, so, well, that, that is a challenge. I mean, in, in formal leadership roles, you know, they, they, you know, they should allocate appropriate time to, to, do, the, to do the task. I, for a lot, for most clinicians, it's, you know, it, it's, it's done in their SPA time and often, you know, beyond that, in the evenings and you know, in, in, in gaps between between clinical between clinical sessions, and I think that can be a real challenge. And I'm I'm concerned that the drive down for SPA time is somewhat short sighted. Is it? 
as it's kind of potentially driving the opportunity for people to be actively involved in their leadership roles uh, away. And if we don't have that time, we'll carry on doing just more of the same instead of making the transformative changes to the service uh, that, that we do. So I think it's it's about planning. It's about thinking if you're part of a team who can, you know, who within the team is best place to carry out particular parts of 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 of, uh, of, of the work uh, that, that you're all trying to achieve together. Can be a bit of a fudge at times, I must admit. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Vince. Um, it doesn't look like we've got any other questions at the moment. Um, so, like I said, um, feel free to give uh, Vince an email or email any of the uh, one of the appropriate email boxes, and and we'll certainly pass it on to Vince to get back to you. Um, just a, a reminder that the um, the webinar, the recording of the webinar, will be available to view on the websites. So that's either the ECIP, AEC, or AFN website. Um, oh, another question has just popped up. Uh, Vince, um, okay. a gentleman called Deo, uh, there's no surname, um, asking, do you have any good practical examples of making what's in it for me work? I'm thinking perhaps of getting staff to do an extra assessment, etc. Uh, yeah, I think there's lots of examples where, you know, clinicians, you know, are, pre are, are prepared to make the change. I, th I, th I think the issue is the time and the conversation that goes in beforehand uh, about building the trust about what what we're trying to achieve and do and that I uh, you know what will lead to improvement I think the biggest anxieties we come across is people being you know anxious about making changes so I can think of examples where people have changed their weekend on call rotas where they've gone on call more frequently but less intensely, uh, but we're understandably apprehensive about making the change. So, so that's examples. I think there are examples in the emergency departments that have implemented uh, early early assessment. There's examples in uh, you know frailty teams that have been used to working in a completely different environment, establishing new acute frailty services as well. And one of the areas that I love working in around ambulatory emergency care, you know, people that have been apprehensive and worried about making the change, you know, when you're able to try and address their concerns and reassure them as best we can, I, that have then gone ahead and implemented it, been you know, really pleased that they feel they're providing a you know a better quality of of of, of, of service. So I think there's there's lots of examples uh, out there where people people do that. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Vince. Um, there aren't any other questions at the moment. So just to say thank you for taking the time out to provide us with this presentation, Vince. Um, it's very much appreciated. <coughs> Oh, another question's just popped up um, from Matthew Sweeting again. Um, quality improvement is often perceived by clinicians as a woolly science and certainly second-rate clinical research. How do you go about convincing colleagues that your QI work is valid? All right, that's that is really interesting. I think. It is really because I think part of it comes from our medical training and our training in research and that we don't really have a training in improvement. So it does feel a bit of a bit nebulous and strange. So I, th I think we're at the, the, you know, that we're at a stage where we are having to continue to make the case of using improvement methodology. The, one of the ways that I approach this is to talk about how this is used in other, uh, you know, other industries and other spheres. Uh, you know, so understanding how the example of statistical process control was developed and used in, you know, process engineering how it's used across industry, 
uh, how there's a statistical basis uh, to inform and understand uh, how service improvements can be measured and recorded. I, I think building up the case in that way, being able to point to some of the research around it and how it's developing and evolving. So, for example, I recently, you know, asked to get involved in a, a national change project. In that national change project, they are using traditional biomedical statistics, and have you calculated a power number that suggests they need an enormous amount of case note reviews to do their evaluation, when in fact they are using completely wrong statistical methodology and they should be using SPC uh, to, to understand and inform what the, the change that has been made. So I think part of it is that there is not an awareness of what a service improvement is, there is not an understanding that it has a rationale, a methodology and a statistical basis behind it and that we need to articulate that and discuss that with colleagues, inform them and provide them with opportunities to learn more about it. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Matthew, for your, for your questions. Um, so, as I said, uh, as there are no more questions, um, like I say, feel free to email if you think of anything after the webinar finishes. And um, like I said, the recording will be available on the website shortly. And just to say um, goodbye from both of us and thank you for joining this webinar today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.